About a month ago, I realized graphics are kind of cool. Why not do, I said. And then I stood in the corner of my room and danced like CJ from GTA San Andreas for three hours. After wiping the sweat from my brow, I decided I'd try to make Minecraft in a weekend. I must have been delirious from all my frivolous dancing because it's been a month and I haven't even gotten close. Anyways, here's an intro to Pearl and Noise in Unity. I'm going to try to not embellish this video because I want to do this quickly. Because, surprisingly, Pearl and Noise is more complicated than just using mathf.perlandnoise. For God's sake, Sebastian Legg has a 21-part video series on the topic. So, to prevent us from being here for six and a half hours, and yes, that is exactly how long Sebastian's series is, we should get started. First, what is Pearl and Noise? A dictionary would tell you that Pearl and Noise is a pseudo-random, coherent, or gradient noise algorithm. So let's break this down into language normal people speak. Pseudo-random means that it seems random, but it really isn't, because the random values are determined by a mathematical algorithm that often loops or logically repeats. I won't speak much on it here because I have a video planned, but if you are curious, two common random algorithms that are easy to learn are the middle square algorithm and the linear congruent con congru this word generator. PBS also has an interesting video on the topic. What is important to know is that if you put the same numbers into the Perlin noise algorithm, you will always get the same result. Kind of like how 2 plus 2 will always be 5. Next, coherent means logical or consistent. Gradient means a gradual change from one value to another, or in this context, we can think of a Photoshop gradient. And lastly, noise, yes that noise, or exactly what you would hear and see if you turned on an old school TV and forgot to pay the cable bill. So now we have a seemingly random noise generator that logically transitions from one value to another gradually. Cool. If you still have no clue, here is a picture of random noise, and here is one layer of Perlin noise. Next, we need to visualize what the Perlin noise algorithm is doing. And before we continue, the actual process uses unit vectors, unit circles, component form calculation, magnitude calculation, dot product calculation, cosine interpolation, and at the bare minimum middle square pseudo random calculation which is reliant on the x and y values of each coordinate. If you're looking to write your own Perlin noise algorithm, start there. But for now, imagine you have a grid, like the type of grid you would have had in high school algebra. Sorry if I'm bringing back bad memories, but each grid point is assigned a whole number coordinate or what was learned as x, y encased in parentheses. Each coordinate is assigned a random angle between 0 and 360 degrees, and this angle never changes for that coordinate. Now if we focus on a single coordinate and its random angle, we can visualize this angle as an arrow. This arrow determines the direction of a gradient from a value of negative 1 to 1. This value is then shifted to span from 0 to 1 and is often visualized as a gradient from black to white. This gradient takes up the space of all four attached grid tiles, or nine grid points making a cube around the center coordinate. If you do this for every grid point, that means that each grid tile is a combination of four different gradients. These gradients are then blended together using interpolation, and if you do this for every grid tile, the result is Perlin noise. Pretty cool if you're a huge nerd, but the most important thing to know is that this is all achieved mathematically, using numbers. Scary, scary numbers. The output, or what we typically see, is simply a translation of the values that the algorithm produces. Being that Perlin noise is created using numbers and numbers can be infinite, this means that Perlin noise can be infinite as well. But there is absolutely no point to this as 0.75 translated into a color value is indistinguishable from 0 0.75000001. So, the Perlin noise algorithm is heavily dependent on the input from the user, as it only will output values based on what the user inputs in order to save memory space. You can think of this as something like choosing your own image resolution, or as a more fun example, you can watch this video about George Washington.
Let's talk code. The best way to understand Perlin noise is to display the output as a texture and play with it like you are 11 again. So let's start a new 3D Unity project and get started. Once the project starts, click on the main camera under the loaded scene and in the inspector switch the clear flags to solid color and change the background to black. Next, right click inside of the scene and create a 3D object called a quad. Click on the newly created quad and in the inspector, scale the quad to 10 by 10 and change the position to be more centered. This quad is affected by the lighting in the scene, and this reduces the visibility of what's going on, so instead let's create a new material by right clicking in the project folder and select create material. If you click on this material in the inspector, you can change the shader from standard to an unlit texture and then click and drag this onto the mesh renderer for the quad. Remove the collider and then we can code. Create a new C Sharp script on the quad and hop it to your editor. To start off, we need to create a few public global variables so we can edit them inside of Unity at playtime to see the different effects. Firstly, we need two public integer variables that affect the resolution of the texture. This resolution easily translates to terrain height maps and other uses for Perlin noise. So think about this value broadly instead of thinking of it strictly as a resolution of a texture. Next, we need three public floating point variables. The first I named Perlin Scale as it increases the amount of Perlin noise grid points that are being referenced. The last two are named X Offset and Y Offset as they allow us to translate ourselves along the Perlin noise grid, or probably more accurately, it allows us to scroll through the Perlin noise. Since we are going to be working and editing our Perlin noise in real time, we can delete the start method and instead focus on the update method. Inside update, we need a reference to our renderer component as we need to apply the Perlin noise to the quad through a renderer as a texture. We'll call get component of type renderer and save it as a variable to get this done. Next, create a new function below the update method and have the function return a texture 2D. The first line of code in this function is the creation of a new texture 2D variable and upon instantiate we need to feed this variable both of our public integer variables from before. After that, we need to iterate over each pixel in the texture, and like the George Washington video, pull values from the Perlin noise algorithm. We do this with a nested for loop for two reasons. Reason number one is obvious because we need to set the values for each pixel. The second reason is because of sequential enumeration, which is a fancy way of saying looping in order. Reason being, if we go back to the George Washington video, it wouldn't make much sense if after punching out each tiny square, he scrambled the squares and expected it to still look like good old GW. So the first for loop will be compared against the texture's width, and we'll call this variable x. The second for loop will be using the texture's height, and we'll call this variable y. And the heart of this nested for loop is where the work is done. Firstly, we mentioned that the Perlin noise grid is created using whole numbers, and that the gradients from 0 to 1 are centered around these whole number coordinates. And here's my door the Explorer moment of the episode. So what do you think happens if we pull values from the algorithm using whole number coordinates? That's right! No matter the whole number that we input, we will always get an output of 0.5, because the whole number coordinates are the centers of the gradients. Good job. This means we need to avoid whole number integers as much as possible to get the best looking output. A little bit of simple math can get this done. We'll start by making an X value input and we'll mirror it on the Y value input. So firstly, we'll start by making a floating point variable. We'll call this X chord. Because it sounds cool and also because it directly relates to where we are on the X axis inside of the Perlin grid. Being this is the X chord, we will use the X variable from the X for loop. And the best possible way to ensure that something is a decimal value is to divide it by the maximum value it could possibly be, meaning it can only range from zero to one. This is also called normalizing. So in order to normalize our X chord, we need to divide our X by the maximum value it could be, which is our texture width. And considering both our x and our texture width are integers, we need to cast these as a float so we can get that sweet, sweet decimal point, baby. 
Now if you plug in some values, you will quickly notice that we stay between 0 and 1. Nice, but also uh, not nice. If we stay only within 0 and 1, then that means we are only ever using one grid tile of the Perlin noise algorithm, and that is not interesting at all. To combat this, we use multiplication. And it makes sense if you think about it. As it stands, our X chord spans from 0 to 1. We can scale these values by multiplying them by a factor that we can choose. For example, if we want 5 times the amount of Perlin grid points to reference from, then we multiply by 5, because 0 times 5 is 0, and 1 times 5 is 5, meaning our X chord now spans from 0 to 5. If you've fallen asleep by this point, uh, please wake up. We want to do this in real time, so we'll use the variable Perlin scale that we created earlier. Lastly, we want to be able to scroll through the Perlin grid because, if you remember, the same values input into the algorithm will always output the same values, so we need more variety. We can do this with addition. This also makes a lot of sense if you do the math. In our example before, our X chord was being multiplied by 5 and spanning from 0 to 5. Now, if after we multiply, we add, let's say, 20, our X chord now spans from 20 to 25. We also want to be able to do this in real time, so let's use our X offset variable that we created before. Okay, now we have a complete X chord. We can now mirror this for the Y chord as well. Copy the X chord line, paste it underneath, and we will change a few things. Firstly, change the name to Y chord, and then change the X to a Y. Instead of using the texture width, we use the texture height. And lastly, instead of the X offset, we will use the Y offset. And boom, we now have our inputs for the Perlin noise algorithm, and all it took was my sanity. This is the part we all know and love. We can call mathf.perlinnoise and feed the function our X chord and Y chord. Mathf.perlinnoise returns a number between 0 and 1, and we can save this as a float variable. The last step of our nested for loop is the sequential enumeration part we talked about earlier. George Washington does have to be put in order after all. We need to set the texture's pixel value using the X and Y location we are using to calculate the Perlin noise value. To do this, we call our texture 2 d variable dot set pixel and feed it three different arguments. The first being the X from our X loop, the second being the Y from our Y loop, and the last we instantiate a new color variable and feed the returned float from mathf.perlinnoise as the red, green, and blue values. Four more lines of code to go. After the for loops, we will set the texture's filter mode to point to eliminate all filtering and blending done by the Unity engine. Then we apply the texture by calling the apply function. After that, we return our texture 2D variable. And lastly, in our update method, after our renderer variable, we need to set the renderer's materials main texture equal to our function that we created. Before we leave, clean up the code by removing the useless using statements, and I like to move the starting curly bracket to the line prior. I don't know why, I just like the way it looks. Here's a screenshot of the code if you want to copy it. If we hop back into Unity, on your quad you will now see that your script has the five public variables, and just to start, let's set both the texture width and height to 100. We can set the Perlin scale to 5, and the X offset and Y offset can be set to 20. Save your scene, and then hit play. Voila, you have Le Perlin Noise. Now let's play around. If you change your texture width and height to something much smaller, let's say 20 each, you will get a much clearer version of the George Washington effect from the video. Now reset it to 100. If you set it to something much higher, let's say 200, you will notice that not a lot changes, so it is important to only use just enough samples because anything higher will needlessly slow down the process. Alright, let's reset the texture back to 100, and now we can adjust the Perlin scale. If we click over the variable name, it will allow us to change the values with the mouse instead of typing. If you move the mouse to the right, you will see the Perlin noise grid grow, like we talked about before. To the left, it shrinks. If we set the value to 1, we see how boring Perlin noise would be without scaling it. Lastly, you can click the X offset or Y offset value and gradually change those to see the scrolling effect. 
This is cool and all, but what about actually using this for terrain? This will be done in the next video, as I'm sure this video is already 15 minutes long or something, and we'll also talk about octaves. I also created my own Pro and Noise algorithm, so I'll probably do a video on that as well. If you don't want to wait for my next upload, like I said, Sebastian Leg does have a 21 part series, which really begs to question, why am I doing this? Either way, link in the description if you want to watch his videos. But for now, thank you for watching, like, comment, and subscribe, or I will literally come over there and erase your hard drives. Okay, bye.